Yeah, that's okay. Just get a little to your right. To my right. Or, sorry, your left, my right. Yeah, perfect. Okay. Let me know when you're ready. Action. Okay. All right. Hello, everyone. My name is Hong, and I'm from Beijing, China. Today, I'm going to present you on the topic of digital form fashion. So, mm -mm. what's special about it? Well, here I have three key terms for you: one third, adolescence, and inescapable. Let's go with one third. According to Chang, form, form shaft fracture, fractures represent one third of the common fractures in children, and complete shaft fractures involving both radius and ulna present a man, management challenge because of their inherent instability. Adolescence. Cultural and peer study have shown that the incidence of distal form fracture in children peaks during early adolescence around the time of their pu uh, pubertary growth spurt. And then, inescapable. As Park has suggested in his study, form fracture in adolescents are an inescapable consequence of an appropriate level of physical activity and are the price that has to be paid in order to maximize bone growth and accumulation of uh, bone density and also to minimize fracture risk in the older ages. So here we have our four aspects. Thomas. Thomas, a 14-year-old male soccer player, goalkeeper, suffered both bone fracture on his left arm in an attempt to dive and save for a ball. He had no previous history or pathology on his left arm. Goalkeepers, by nature, have exposure to a higher number or higher risk of upper body injury because they have to do multiple diving and saving drills or movement. The impact of the ball against the hands while risk making the save produce a similar mechanism of axial loading and similar to the mechanism of push. If, su if sufficient force and energy are involved, fracture of the distal radius and honor may result. This mechanism of injury and the potential, potential influence of this injury have not, have not been readily, readily or widely recognized by the population, especially in young goalkeeper. In this case, our goalie trained with a number five size soccer ball with an, with an adult coach, which is a number five size ball is not designed for adult. Uh, designed for adults but not for teenager. Due to the inadequate kicking force by the coach and also the inadequate training both selection, the goalie suffered excessive momentum on his forearm, resulting in a fracture. As a mechanism, mechanism of protection, both bones were fractured to unload the blunt force he suffered there. Anatomy, here we're going to go through anatomy real quick, I have a quick review on bone structure, soft tissue, artery, veins, nerves, and muscle. Bony structure of soft tissue. The forearm comprised of three joints, excluding wrist and uh, elbow. They are proximal radial honor joint, medial honor, radial honor joint, interosseous membrane, and the distal radial honor joint. The bones involved in forearm are majorly radius and ulna and the ligaments involved there is interosseous membrane, since we're not considering elbow or wrist. Arteries, major arteries in forearm, brachial artery, radial artery, and the palmar arch. Veins, there are many veins in our forearm. There's the uh, dorsal venous network on the back of our hand, Superficial, superficial veins on the back of the forearm, cephalic and basalic vein on the forearm. 
nerve. Then there's median nerve, ulnar nerve, radial nerve, and the musculocutaneous nerve in our form. Nerve in the form branches from brachial plexus in the, in the neck and then travel through the arm to supply the elbow and the forearm. Some of these nerves come through the forearm to supply the wrist and hand also. Nerves in the forearm include these three we've mentioned above. For the radial nerve, its major innovations are tricep brachii, brachial radialis, extensor carpi radialis longus, and uh, angulus. For the median nerve, it innervates all the flexors in the forearm except for flexor carpi ulnaris and part of the flexor digitorum profundus. And then for the last, the ulnar nerve, it innervates hypothenar muscles in our hand, the third and the fourth on lumboricum muscles, some dorsal interosei, palmar interosei in our hand, abductor pollicis, and the flexor pollicis brevis. And muscles, there are many muscles in the forearm, India, the, uh, and they are categorized into two compartments anterior and posteriorly. Within each compartment, they are then further categorized into superficial, intermediate, deep, and for posterior, we have deep and superficial. The flexor digitorum superficialis is the only muscle in the, immediate, in the intermediate compartment of anterior compartment of the forearm. And then the muscles in the posterior compartment of the forearms are commonly, commonly, commonly known as extensor muscles. The, uh, their general function is to produce extension in the wrist and fingers. They're all innervated by the radial nerve. And then in the posterior compartment, there's deep and superficial. There are five muscles in the deep compartment of the posterior compartment. Going to assess, assessment and care. So upon injury, our tomas display localized pain, tenderness, and swelling in the fracture side. Our athletes suffered a, a closed fracture, which means there's no bones expo exposed. Obvious deformity was observed at the schistal forearm, showing a false joint. Clinical examination here. We use the OK sign to test his median nerve. Then for, we use active, active extension of the finger and wrist to show there's no damage done to his radial nerve. And then we have him spread his finger to test the integrity of his ulnar nerve. And then for vascular aspect, we observe swelling in the forearm. And then for the integrity or complete completeness of the vascular tissues, we check capillary review. Radial and post, radial or uh, ulnar post will, are preferred ways to check circulation. However, in this case, because of the swelling and tenderness, we were not able to hurt them. Treatment decision. Previous studies estimate that the failure of non-operative treatment of Misha for common shaft fracture in forearm ranges between 39% to 64% high of failure rate. As many as 60% of children uh, have residual loss of motion due to the angulation or mal reunion of their recovery. Since uh, both of the bones were fractured, our Thomas here decided to go surgically repair for his, for his bony structure, so that way he um, have a higher percentage of return to play safely and a less chance of angulation or going back to surgery again. Post-operative care. A posterior splint was applied for one or two weeks for his comfort. Thomas was encouraged to uh, perform both active and active assisted range of motion exercise of the shoulder and the hand involved on the same side. Elbow, and elbow range of motion, supination, pronation exercise began as soon as the remission of pain and swelling of the forearm permits after the splint was removed. Rehabilitation, uh, rehabilitation goal. So here we 
have to manage pain, control inflammation, range of motion, strength, proprioception, motor control, sports specific, sports specific, specific and then the most important, importantly, psychological acclimatization to the to the to the environment is gonna face again and come back from the catastrophic injury. Here's an overview of the rehabilitation. So phase one, from day one to one week, our main focus is gonna be pain, swelling, range of motion in shoulder, avoiding uh, capsulitis, and also prevent atrophy in the related muscles. And then for phase two, around two weeks, we progress them into some range of motion exercise, strength in the finger to keep all the long extensor or flexor in the forearm flexible and maintain their strengths. Then, four to six, four to six weeks, we started a range of motion in all joints, range of motion exercise in all joints. And we have a focus on his grip strength, trying to recover some of his uh, intrinsic muscle in hand and also in forearm. Then, uh, phase four, sort of the last phase. It started from uh, eight week to last day to about 12 week. And during this time, we allow full weight burning full weight bearing of his forearm, and we started ADL with his effective length. Then the last phase is a progressive loading phase. During that phase, he can return to play already, but since bones take a long time to heal, we still want him to come in, focus on his functional activity, progressive load his bone and muscle, give him better growth, stronger recovery, and then help him recover psychologically. So phase one of the rehab phase, the, st the st stability of the pressure side is not, it's just out of, outside of the coming out of operation. The state of bone hitting is still in, in, in inflammatory space, and uh, the x-ray of his forearm shows there's no catalyst for me. No weight bearing is allowed during this time frame, and uh, we used radiography, specifically anterior, posterior, and lateral graphs to follow and monitor his uh, fracture healing. Range of motion, range of, active range of motion uh, started three to five days after surgery to decrease his edema and stiffness. And they are also used to uh, prevent capsulitis in the, sh uh, in the shoulder and decrease stiffness of the wrist and the elbow. Strength-wise, asymmetric exercises were done to his bicep, tricep, and deltoid in an attempt to prevent Atrophy and activity-wise, the uninvolved extremity can do all of the function, and the involved ones are encouraged to actively rest. And he's he's uh, suggested to take self-care, such as feeding, dressing, and personal hygiene, which is ineffective. And here are some of the exercises we did. We have some asymmetric flexion extension of the elbow with manual resistance, but keep the keep the resistance on the above or more proximal to the structure side so we don't directly stress the uh, scar tissue. Then there's shoulder flexion and there's pain a lot, so we're gonna do some pump, uh, fist pumping, helping out with the edema, and some marble heat of expanding the down a lot to work on the intrinsic muscle. Phase two. Phase two uh, started at two weeks. Fresh stability and fracture side is still known to very minimal. Everything's still healing. Stage of the bone healing process. We're beginning of the reparative phase, but it's going to take a long time, and little catalysts might work during that phase, not a lot. Still, no way bearing, and the uh, radiograph is going to keep the same to, just to keep track of his, his healing process. During this phase, range of motion. We started active range of motion on his digits, on his wrist, elbow, shoulder, again, trying to maintain maintain his range of motion, avoid capsulitis or all the tendonitis. And also started, started to work on some of the digits that I help him recover faster in his forearm. Strength-wise, we're still focusing on the rest of the muscle, bicep, tricep, waist, above fracture side, so he doesn't stress. And we have some uh, gentle asymmetric magic gentle asymmetrics exercising fingers to try to stimulate his four muscle. And then we have functional, uh, functional activities, continue to use and involve extremity. This is pretty similar to phase one in some of, some of the focus. Rehabilitation exercise with flexion, extension of the elbow, that is the same with phase one. 
we added bowl squeezing to put, put more uh, exercise on his finger. Passive active wrist flexion, range of motion exercise. Some of them are um, overlapped with the first phase. For phase three, six, four to six weeks. The stability of the fracture side is getting better and uh, safe healing is, we're still in repairing phase but we have a lot of progression in there. Actually, we're used to, uh, again, keep track of his healing. There might be no or little callus because primary bone healing predominates. And at this time, fracture line should become less visible. No web bearing, again, a lot and uh, videography to keep track. Range of motion. We added a strength. During this phase, we have a strong focus on grip strength. And uh, if he's paying a loss, especially after the past six weeks, we are going, we, we progress into no more than five pounds of resistance. If he's, if he's a range of motion, achieves functional in some of the rest of the phase three exercise. And then the last phase is phase four, eight to 12 weeks. We have pretty, well, pretty stable fracture site fracture sensibility right now. And then the fracture the X-ray showed the groove resolves. The rest of the rest, the rest of them are similar, but both weight bearing wise, cast is removed past eight weeks. We try to have some full full weight bearing at 12 weeks. Then phase four, full range of motion at all joints, including uh, arm, uh, wrist and elbow, active assisted range of motion, strength. We're trying to still trying to increase grip strength progressive uh, resistive exercise to load him and function activity. Try to, uh, now we have to do, he, use his effective strength for, for his uh, active daily life. And no, but with no lifting heavier than the weight of a telephone book around two and a half, two and a half pound. And then here is some exercise. And after that, he can return to play. But see when I use some progression over here to help him progress the load of his structure.